Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, my name is Emily Sire, and I teach voice here at UMass Boston and also at the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley. And I wanted to talk with all of you today about a topic that's really important to me. It's probably important to every voice teacher and singer, um, and hopefully it's important to all of you as well, and that is voice function, voice health, and voice injury, um, so that you can be empowered with some knowledge about how our voices work, how to recognize if something is not working well with your voice, and what to do about it. So I'd love to just get a little lay of who's here before diving into the presentation. So how many of you are music majors? That's a lot. Music minors? OK. And theater people? OK, cool. That was my sense. Very nice. All right. And voice teachers? Yay. OK, great. So now we all have a sense of who's here. Really happy to have all of you. So in the presentation today, um, we're going to speak a little bit about the four systems of voice production so that you have just a little overview as to how the voice as an instrument functions. Then we'll talk about voice hygiene, which is just basically parameters for how we can take care of our voices day to day voice injuries and disorders, things that can go wrong. We're going to debunk a, a couple of very common vocal myths, and then we're going to have some time for questions at the end. So the systems of voice production, we have respiration, which has to do with breathing, phonation, which is actually what's happening at the level of our vocal cords, resonance, which is how we shape a sound source to make vowels and other sounds, and then articulation, which is how we create words. And we're going to go through each of these processes just a little bit, just so that you have some background. So respiration is really, at a scientific level, the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in our bodies. It's how our blood oxygenates. It's how we stay alive. So that's, of course, the primary function of respiration. It's not to sing. It's not to speak. But it's just to stay alive and um, maintain our vital functions. So we have uh, muscles for inspiration, which has to do with how we bring air into our lungs, and then muscles for expiration. So our muscles for inspiration are our diaphragm, which gets a lot of attention. Um, Every singer has probably heard sing from your diaphragm. It's an important muscle. Um, and then we have the external intercostal muscles, which live between our ribs. So when those muscles engage, they open up our rib cage. And as a result, it creates a, a pressure vacuum in our chest. And air then is sucked into our lungs. So we often think of the lungs as doing the job of breathing, as sucking in the air. But really, it's the contraction of these muscles that creates a larger space where then air is sucked in due to pressure differentials. Um, for exhalation, we get the engagement of the abdominal mus musculature and the internal intercostal muscles. Again, those are those muscles kind of between your ribs, so everybody can feel that on yourselves. Between your rib, uh, your 12 ribs, we have these um, these muscles, and when those abdominal muscles engage and the intercostals engage, that pushes the air out of our body, leading to an exhalation. So in singing, we're needing to manage that exhalation. And we do this through beneficial antagonism between our muscles of inspiration and our muscles of expiration. So when your teacher talks to you about supporting your tone, that's really what we're talking about, is about finding the balance between the muscles that bring air in and the muscles that send the air out of our bodies. And successful breath management for singing really depends on the vocal task that you're trying to achieve. So we don't want to take the same kind of breath if we're singing a short phrase versus if we're singing a longer phrase, or if we're trying to sing something in a classical style versus musical theater style. We really want to titrate our demands to or our breath to what our demands are. So I should have asked all of you to say where you think the diaphragm is um, before I showed this slide. But we often have our diaphragm mapped very low in our body. We think, oh, here's my diaphragm, and we think somewhere down here. But really, our diaphragm is sitting really quite high in our body. It's inside the rib cage. Um, and it's an important muscle, and it's a muscle that's largely involuntary. So when it contracts, when we take a breath in, it comes down. And then when we release our air, it returns to a neutral position. And it doesn't move a tremendous amount, but a little bit. So breath, respiration, is the power source that provides the fuel to bring our vocal folds together to create a sound wave. And that process is called phonation. 
So phonation is the process of converting the air pressure from the lungs into audible vibrations. So we all have a set of vocal cords, um, which are two vibrating ligaments in the larynx. Has anybody ever gone to a voice doctor and seen their vocal cords before? Yes, all the voice teachers, good. Well, hopefully some of you will feel empowered after this presentation to go to a voice doctor when you need to. Um, but originally these little vibrating structures had an evolutionary function, which was to create pressure in the thorax to aid in um, having a baby, for example. Um, it wasn't necessarily made to make like beautiful sounds, but that is how we've evolved to create beautiful sounds and to communicate. Um, there's something called the Bernoulli effect, that when air comes from our lungs up through our trachea and touches our vocal folds and we decide that we want to speak, that air um, sucks the vocal folds back together continuously, so we get this, this rippling motion um, that creates sound or phonation. And we all know about voiced versus unvoiced sound, so I want to experiment for a second with that. So like S, is an unvoiced sound. So let's all just put our hands on our throats, which maybe we're not used to doing. And I want everyone to go Good. And you probably don't feel a lot of vibration in your throat. And now I want you to go Good. That's a voiced versus an unvoiced sound. So we feel that, that vibration happening. That's our vocal folds coming together many, many, many times per second. Um, so if you're singing like a high C, if you're a soprano, your vocal folds are coming together a thousand times per second, which is a tremendous number of times. So they're so quick that we really can't see them unless we use a special tool called stroboscopy, which is what's used in laryngologists' offices. So there's two processes involved in phonation. We have adduction with ADD, and we have abduction, ABD. Adduction refers to bringing together our vocal folds. We're adding, we're bringing together. And that's what's happening when we're speaking. Our vocal folds come together, and again, they're opening and closing very quickly. Um, when our vocal folds are abducting, that's for breathing, they're open. So you've probably all noticed that you cannot speak um, when you are breathing, unless you're doing inhalation phonation, which is kind of a weird, scary thing um, that sounds like, hi, how are you? And we don't typically talk like that, um, unless we're in a horror movie, like in that Jordan Peele's movie, Us, she talks in um, inhalation phonation a lot. But um, there are two major muscles that control for pitch. So for lower pitches, our vocal folds are in a more contracted state. They're shorter. And for higher pitches, they're actually lengthening more. Um, and there are two muscles that control that. One is called the thyroretinoid muscle. That's the body of the vocal folds themselves. And the other is called the cricothyroid muscle. And that is responsible for lengthening our vocal folds. And we can have a lot of different qualities of phonation depending on how much breath is coming through our mechanism and when the breath is passing through our vocal folds. So if we're speaking with not a lot of breath flow, we might have kind of a pressed voice quality, not a lot of breath flow and a lot of tight closure of our vocal cords. If we're speaking kind of breathy, we have a lot more breath flow. And if we're kind of balanced, which hopefully I am now, we have kind of in between like a good amount of breath flow and also a good amount of closure of our vocal cords. So that's a little bit about the interaction of respiration and phonation. And then we have resonance, and this is kind of your internal concert hall. So we've all had that experience before of being in the shower, right? And you're like, oh, it feels so good to sing in the shower. I love singing in the shower. Who likes singing in the shower? Yeah. It's awesome. We sound amazing. Um, and then we've also probably had the experience of singing in a really dry room, right? Where it's not that the air is dry, it's that it's acoustically dry. It feels like you can't hear yourself well. You're not getting a lot of echo effect coming back. This is because sound is waves and sound waves bounce off of things and move around a space and it's the same thing with the sound wave generated by our vocal folds it bounces off our vocal tract which is everything above our vocal folds and um, certain aspects of the sound are amplified and certain aspects are kind of minimized depending on how we're shaping our resonator 
So one definition of resonance is the intensification and enriching of a musical tone by supplementary vibration. So when your teacher talks about having good resonance, oh, you have really good resonance. We're, we're having good efficiency of voicing. We're, we're not working too hard. We're, our voice is carrying. We're getting a lot of power for minimal effort. Um, that is good resonance. And so there's something called the source filter theory of voice production. And this talks about how uh, what's created, the sound source that comes from our vocal folds, is filtered through the vocal tract. And that's what creates a sound. Um, and that process is not just linear, but it's, it's nonlinear. So the sound bounces off all of your teeth and all of your structures, your throat, and then it creates more efficiency or less efficiency at your vocal folds. So these processes of phonation and of resonance are very interrelated to each other. Um, we have several resonance chambers, our oral cavity, or our mouth, our nasal cavity, and our throat. And then we have all of these adjustable parameters like our lips, our tongue, our soft palate, our throat, and our voice box. This is a really interesting video that shows a little bit about the impact of the vocal tract on sound. So this is a, a scientific synthesis. Um, there's a buzz created that's kind of the sound of the vocal folds themselves. If you took them out of your body and you could just bring them together, they'd just sound like zzzz. And then they put a vocal tract, a model vocal tract on top, and you see how it shapes the sound and it creates a vowel. Even though it's not a real person, it's just a shape that they're, that they're putting on top of it going to play a little bit of this. Oops. Sorry. Try again. The sound takes a second, but it will happen. So you hear the tremendous impact that the resonator has on the sound. If we just had the vocal folds, it would sound very kind of blah, just zzz, not a lot of characteristics in that sound besides buzziness. So again, maximizing your resonance is about getting more bang for your buck, and it has an impact on tone color or timbre. So you know, that resonator is going to give your voice its distinctive quality. It's about the shape of your resonance um, system, shape of your vocal tract. That's what's going to give your voice a really unique quality and create color, brightness, darkness, or a more neutral color. And then we have articulation. So articulation is how we create words. It's how we move certain structures, like our lips, our tongue, our soft palate, or our jaw to form words. Um, we have voiced and unvoiced consonant pairs, like the s and the z. And that has to do with whether we're using phonation in the process or just moving air past our articulators. Um, this is a really wonderful video that shows, by showing a beatboxer and an MRI, how much movement we have in our articulators uh, and how much flexibility is demanded by even basic tasks, but this is a real vocal articulatory athlete um, doing something pretty amazing in there. Hello, my name is Timo Schnepp and I'm going to perform a beatbox freestyle inside a real time MRI. Here we go. Just to point out a couple of structures, um, what we have here, this big thing that looks like a big monster, is the tongue. So the tongue is way bigger than what you can see if you go like this, right? It's a big thing that hooks all the way under to your hyoid bone, which is where uh, at the, the top of your laryngeal mechanism. Um, and then we have the soft palate also, which you could, oops, sorry, which you could see a little bit. It was quite flexible as well. So our soft palate's this thing that's moving above the tongue. So you see how much range of motion we have there. He gets kind of crazy as he goes on. So all 
solve, you probably don't need that much flexibility in your articulators, but we still want to strive for flexibility in our articulators overall, in our tongue, our jaw, our soft palate, um, all of those. All right, so moving into the second portion of our presentation, um, I want to walk you through some basics of vo voice hygiene. A lot of these things are things that you probably already know, but hopefully there will be some new stuff that you can take with you. So most importantly, singers are vocal athletes. Um, we use our voices at a very high level. We put high demands on these two little cartilages, little muscles um, in our throat, and as a result, we have to treat it with respect um, and with care. So basic health matters, you know, eat well, have a good healthy diet, move, exercise, and sleep. Those are the basics. Very important to be hydrating regularly over the course of the day. Um, make sure you're drinking enough water. But beyond that, you want to make sure you're humidifying your spaces, especially while you're sleeping, because Boston is particularly dry in the winter when the heat, the forced air comes on. Um, and if you're breathing in through your mouth that dry air, that can be really taxing um, on the voice, which relies on moisture to keep a nice um, supple vibration. So that's very, very important. Another thing you can do to um, up your vocal hygiene game is to steam. Um, steaming is a really wonderful way to take care of your voice. I have a product that I recommend um, for that. But buying a personalized steamer is a great way at the end of the day after a long voice day of rehearsal or lessons to just give your voice that added hydration. That's really the only way we can directly hydrate the vocal folds. We can hydrate them through systemic hydration, but that takes time to get to them. So if we want that kind of burst of hydration, it's helpful to inhale some steam. Um, you can also do that in the shower or over just like a pot. Just make sure not to burn yourself if you put a towel over a pot and inhale the steam. That's really good. Um, knowing that your mind and body are connected, conditions like depression and anxiety, of course, can impact the voice. Um, they impact the way we breathe and the way that we function. So getting good mental health care is important. Avoiding as much as you can talking over noise can be definitely challenging when you're a college student, you're in social situations, but just kind of being aware of your demands, um, of your vocal load, and knowing, okay, this is how much I can kind of use my voice today, I had a big voice day, maybe I'm going to chill out tonight, kind of just, just um, building some awareness around vocal load and voice pacing, taking vocal naps when you can, knowing like, all right, I have a lot to do tonight, I'm going to maybe take a couple of minutes just to chill out and rest my voice um, or do some light humming. Managing allergies and acid reflux, um, that's very important. Uh, these can have a really detrimental impact on the voice. So just making sure that you're taking medicine. If you need to take medicine, I have some, some recommendations for that as well. Don't whisper to save your voice. That's something a lot of us have um, been told or picked up at some point or another, but not really the best um, thing for the vocal folds. Better to just talk quietly um, and rest when you need to rest, but just kind of talking quietly, finding good resonance, using enough breath flow. Those are better ways to take care of your voice. And then knowing that your voice is made of muscles, and so making sure that you're warming up before you're using it, whether that's even speaking, if you have a long-term speaking engagement or you're in a play rehearsal where you have a lot of talking, it can be really easy to neglect that warm-up. But just doing that like 10-minute warm-up routine of humming, moving through your range a little bit, um, warming up your body a little bit makes a really big difference in just getting those muscles, muscles moving and warm. Um, and then making sure that you're cooling down. This is something we forget. If you had a really long voice day, um, just doing some light humming, especially if you've been singing high, you've been doing high intensity belting or something like that, just coming back down um, into your speaking voice, doing some mmm, or whatever you need to just kind of cool down. Lip trills are always really good for that. I'm going to give you some exercises um, as well at the end of this presentation. All right, recognizing the signs of a voice problem. So sudden or gradual but persistent change in the voice is never to be ignored. That can include raspiness, graveliness, fuzziness, hoarseness, loss of range, which could be your high notes or your low notes, weakness, um, loss of your vocal stamina, you know, finding that you're going hoarse over a short period of time having breaks between your registers, cracking uh, between registers, um, losing your dynamic control, particularly your ability to sing 
quietly in the upper register. That's an early sign of vocal dysfunction. And difficulty being heard over noise, feeling like you just can't get that kind of ping in your voice that carries. And if people are asking, what did you say? And you're feeling like you have to force it, that's something to get checked out. Um, pain discomfort is obviously never good. There's a thing you can do um, if you're concerned about your voice health called a swelling check, swelling test. This was invented by um, Dr. Robert Bastian, who's an ENT in Chicago. And it involves just lightly doing staccato um, on a little arpeggio, going up the scale and noticing when does it tap out? Like when, when, does, um, when are you not able to cleanly phonate up there anymore? So a little like, and noticing when you try to go and nothing comes out that's your kind of ceiling for that day and you can monitor it over time and see like if all of a sudden your ceiling for your swelling test is going really down maybe something to to check out so an issue that persists for two weeks or longer or one that is very sudden like if you very suddenly cough and then your voice is gone that warrants evaluation by a medical professional. And particularly if you ever cough um, or sneeze or something like that and your voice just suddenly drops an octave and is gone, that is warning sign for a voice hemorrhage, which is a vocal fold bleed. And that requires really as quickly as you can emergency evaluation to avoid a long-term term problem and immediately being quiet. Um, that is not a common thing that happens, but important to just be aware that it, it does happen to people. Um, and trust yourself. It's very easy to kind of write things off. Oh, maybe I'm getting sick. Oh, but if something is persisting for two weeks, you really, um, it's a really good idea to get checked out. So some risk factors for voice issues. Um, acid reflux, this is something I've been newly dealing with this semester. Um, not fun, definitely um, something to be aware of that it happens. The symptoms of it are a little bit weird sometimes. People don't always have heartburn stuff, but if you're feeling like hoarseness, um, especially after eating, could be um, acid reflux. Dryness, which can be caused by any number of things, caffeine, too much coffee, alcohol, medications, autoimmune issues, um, smoking, vaping, obviously not good for the voice. Um, sometimes people have a, a sort of mis in, are kind of misinformed that marijuana is better than cigarettes. Um, not so much. It's still a foreign substance that you're inhaling through, that's having to go past your vocal folds, and it's really irritating. Um, so avoiding inhaled sus substances. Illnesses, um, sometimes people get just get sick, and they can have a post-viral neuropathy that, that bothers their voice. They can have post-viral swelling. So when you are sick, trying not to sing sick. Um, Allergies can cause post-nasal drip, so making sure you're managing those. Hormonal issues, um, people who have periods, it's important to know that right before your period, um, sometimes people get kind of dysphonic, meaning their, their vocal quality is not as good, they have hoarseness. Um, that's because we get kind of swollen in our bodies sometimes. Um, particularly people who are not on hormonal birth control might be less evened out over the course of the month. And um, just like people get swelling in their uterus that causes cramping, we get swelling at the level of our vocal folds as well. So if you're noticing at that time of the month, oh, I feel like my voice quality is not so good, don't push it. Try to just, just rest as much as you can. Um, and then phonotrauma, another word for overuse. Um, but the field is really trying to take away the stigma. There's been a lot of stigma historically around voice injury, and it really can and does happen to, to a lot of people. Most people who are professional singers at some point will encounter a vocal crisis just because we're athletes, and just like athletes who are on the field, um, nobody bats an eye when they get injured because it's just part of the game, right? It's just like you're out there, you're performing at a super high level, and our bodies are fallible and things happen. Um, so knowing, knowing these risk factors will get you in for treatment faster. Um, so some information about voice, certain voice injuries and disorders. Um, everyone has, of course, heard about nodules, um, nodes. Um, those are vocal fold lesions. So that can include nodules, polyps, granuloma cysts. These are different kinds of vocal fold lesions that are little growths on the cords. I'm going to show a video that shows what that's about. Um, muscle tension dysphonia. That is where there's not a, a structural problem with your vocal cords, but 
rather the muscles around your vocal cords are very tight chronically tight and making it hard for the voice to function as well as it could um, so the treatment for that is really laryngeal massage um, which can be performed by a speech pathologist Vocal hemorrhage, again, is a bleed, a vocal fold bleed um, that can occur after a viral illness. Or if somebody just has a blood vessel on their vocal folds that's too close to the midline, and when their vocal folds come together, it gets kind of smacked and it bleeds. Or if they're on blood thinning medication, it's more common. Um, vocal cord paralysis paresis, this is when one vocal cord can get immobilized a little bit, sometimes after a viral infection, and that can impact um, the quality of the sound creates some hoarseness. There are also neurological issues like spasmodic dysphonia and Parkinson's disease. Um, those are less common, but they do exist. And then, of course, laryngeal cancer, another reason to never ignore a persistent voice problem because, unfortunately, that is something that can, can happen to people. Um, keep in mind, most voice injuries are very treatable and outcomes are positive, even for things like vocal fold surgery. And I think we often think about like Julie Andrews as a case that like went really badly, but there are so many vocal fold surgeries um, done every day now, and most cases have very, very positive outcomes. Um, and most doctors who do this work are very, very wonderful, and, um, and people have really, really good treatment outcomes. So voices can be recovered, and they generally are, but early medical evaluation is treatment is, and treatment is very important. So a little bit about getting evaluated. So there's a big difference between your general run-of-the-mill ENT versus an otolaryngologist. And if you're a professional voice user, you really want to get in to see somebody who specializes in caring for the professional voice. Um, if a place is called a voice center, it's a good chance that they're going to gonna be um, really well schooled in that. These are the doctors at Mass General Hospital and, of course, Steven Tyler, who is not a laryngologist, even though he's wearing a lab coat. But he had vocal fold surgery at Mass General Hospital with the man on the left, Dr. Steven Zytels, who also operated on Adele, Sam Smith, and a number of other professional singers. Um, and the doctor behind him is Dr. James Burns. That's my doctor and the doctor that I recommend um, all my students to see, and many have seen him. And he's a really wonderful doctor over at Mass General um, Hospital. They also have a wonderful uh, team of speech language pathologists who work with people on voice therapy, retraining your speaking voice. Um, doing laryngeal massage. They are really wonderful professionals that basically act as physical therapists for the muscles of our voice. Um, so I'm happy to give more information, but if you just Google Massachusetts General Voice Center, really easy to get an appointment there. They typically can fit people in within a week or two. They're really wonderful. And if you do end up going, just to have a sense of what to expect, it's likely that Dr. Burns will perform stroboscopy on you, which is a laryngoscopy. It's a way to visualize your vocal folds. Is there anybody who's never seen vocal cords before? Don't be ashamed. Oh, great. Cool. First timers. Awesome. Um, yes, so these are the vocal folds. This is what they look like, but they're really way smaller than this. It's this, but they fit on a dime, basically, or a, maybe a nickel. Um, and because they vibrate so quickly, um, they use this machine called a strobe, basically, to create, it creates a strobe light, so it captures um, a picture every couple of cycles and kind of knits them together, so you can see in slow motion the movement of the vocal cord. So here is a normal voice. Here is a look at some normal young female vocal cords during a strobe scope You can see they're shorter when they're vibrating lower. Here is a look at some Oops. And here is a singer, speaker person who's dealing with some nodules. And you can see the edges are not as straight as on the other vocal folds. There's some growths there. As a result, the tone is raspier, there's more air seeping through because those, those growths, those nodules, are preventing the folds from closing fully. Um, 
in each cycle. And, and it's not uncommon um, for people to have vocal fold nodules, and it's also not uncommon for them to heal without surgery, um, just through rest, through voice therapy, through targeted exercises. So that's important to know. Okay, we're almost wrapping up, um, but I want people to know, if you don't already, about straw phonation, which is a really excellent tool um, for dealing with vocal fatigue and other issues. It's called an SOVT, which is a semi-occluded vocal tract exercise, exercise, which is just a fancy way of saying your mouth's kind of closed. Um, and basically, and you can do this with any kind of straw. This is a good size to start with. But um, you put it up to your mouth, and you want to make sure that you're not just humming around it. So we don't want, mm, you could tell I was just humming. We want to actually mm, blow air in through the straw. Mm, 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 and you'll find it will make singing a lot easier, typically, because it creates more efficiency at the level of your vocal folds. So this is a really, really good tool invented by scientists. but co-opted by singers, um, and it's used a lot in voice therapy. So kind of play around with the straw. A uh, kind of modification you can do as well is playing with a straw in water, um, which can make it even more effective because it increases the back pressure. So it's a really, really neat task, especially if you're finding a passage to be particularly challenging. Try bubbling it in water while you're, um, and blowing some bubbles. These are things I might recommend for your voice health toolkit. So a steamer, that's the VIX. Don't put any of the VIX crap in there, just water. Um, this other thing is called My Vocal Mist. Um, it is a bit of invest an investment, it's about $100, but it, um, it's a nebulizer. You, you use a special saline thing that they give you with it, and it delivers hydration even more effectively um, than steam, because the particles are a little smaller. Um, water carry water everywhere. Um, Flonase, I highly recommend that for singers with allergies. Use a nasal steroid over an antihistamine. Antihistamines systemically are very, very drying, so it's typically, uh, their laryngologists recommend avoiding them. And then metal straws. Okay, a couple of myths before we wrap up. Sing from your diaphragm. This is a common thing that that people say. Um, but, you know, the diaphragm is an involuntary muscle, so I don't really know what it means, but I hear people say it a lot. Um, whispering save your voice? No, please don't. Um, honey coats your vocal cords? It doesn't. It goes into the other pipe, which is our, our food pipe. If it went into our wind pipe, you'd be aspirating, and that would be bad. Um, if you sing classical music while well, you can sing anything? Not really. Different styles demand different um, approaches to breath, different approaches to resonance and registration. Vocal injuries are always caused by poor technique. I think that is quite rare, actually, that there's not a, a compounding voice hygiene issue that someone is dealing with that, that predisposes them, or even genetics. Um, singers shouldn't run long distances or do lots of crunches. Exercise is really good for singers. You probably don't want to be chronically tight, but um, I've definitely heard voice teachers say this before, like, don't do any crunches or you're not going to be able to breathe for singing. It's a little silly. Um, I should always take a huge breath for singing, and support should feel like a lot of effort. Ideally, when we're singing efficiently, we don't want it to feel like a lot of effort. We want to feel like um, like it's easy and like and balanced. Okay, I know that was a lot of information I just threw at you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, I, so I have two questions. Um, so when would we know when to rest our voice? That's a really good question. I would say um, this is this is something that's constantly being debated in the voice health world because a lot of times voice rest is over prescribed when it's not really warranted and it's actually better to keep the tissues moving but if you're feeling like you've completely lost your voice you have laryngitis rest is a very good idea at that point um, so yes always in the case of like a viral laryngitis i would rest your voice as much as you can and steam um, in other cases, like when you, if you were to have a voice injury, like nodules, a lot of times complete voice rest is very rarely indicated, except for after like a vocal fold surgery. So um, in that case, you would want to talk to like a speech language pathologist, whoever was on your team. I think voice rest, little voice naps are great, but it would be a rare case in which I would recommend that a student be silent for days, days at a time. I 
except when you have viral laryngitis. Yeah. And the second question that I had is, um, uh, could you possibly send me this presentation? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to send it to anybody. Um, so if you are interested in receiving the, the presentation, shoot me an email at um, emily.sire at umb.edu, I think is my email. I should have put it on here, but yeah, happy to share it. Yes. Um, so for someone like me who struggles with asthma, um, mm. what do you have? I mean, I, I had a previous global teacher that said the Alexander technique is very good for that. Are there any other recommendations for, you know, singers who struggle with asthma? That's a great question. Um, I've not done a lot of research on asthma. I know it impacts a lot of singers. Um, and that, uh, do you take like an inhaled, do you use an inhaler? I have a rescue inhaler and when my seasonal allergies get worse, then I take something more. Something more. Um, yes, I think any kind of like body awareness, like Alexander would be great. Um, body mapping, exercise as you can tolerate it um, with asthma, which I know is sometimes really challenging for people. I don't have a lot, I don't know a lot about it beyond that, but I will say one thing that's important to keep in mind if you have asthma that I didn't include on here is um, that with inhaled corticosteroids, fungal infections are more of a risk um, and that sometimes people can get laryngeal thrush, um, like very rarely, but it can happen. So just really making sure your inhaler is clean. And then also if you're feeling like you're having an issue um, to go get scoped and that, that can be dealt with pretty quickly with antifungal medicines, but um, the people in that group are at a bigger risk for that particular like weird random issue than, than um, those of us who aren't taking in, inhalers. So just being aware of that. But, um, but I know so many singers with asthma who sing very, very beautifully. And I know it's not fun to manage, but I know it can be done. Sorry that I don't know more about it. <laughs> yes, Jess. Yes. My brain, but I also know that, it's, that I'm in charge of my diaphragm after years of training that I can get in touch with it and make it do what I want. So why is it kind of an involuntary muscle? Is it both? It's weird because it is kind of both. It act, it acts involuntarily. Um, like it's func it functions with our nervous system when we're sleeping. We don't have to think about it, obviously, but it also can be under our conscious control in terms of being able to negotiate breath management for singing. So we're making sure that it's we manage how quickly it comes back up um, into its resting position. So that's a, a very good point. It's one of those rare muscles in the body where like we can control it, like we can control our breathing, but if we let it go, it'll do its own thing in its own way. That's a really good point. Well, I guess now to mention it, we can slow our heart rate down too, but that's also an involuntary muscle. Yeah. The other thing that, and I know we don't have very much time, the other thing that I wanted to ask you, because it's something that actually I've been very curious about, and that is, um, I know back pressure feels good. So I know when I do the blowing through the straw, I know that it really relaxes the lump of my throat, and I know it feels good. But now I really don't know why. Why does back pressure, and how does it Basically, it, yeah, it's a very complicated question, actually. I'm not really, no, that's okay. Um, Ingo Tietze, who's the guy who invented straw foundation, would have a much better answer than I do. But my understanding is that basically that back pressure helps to square up the vocal cords um, so that we get fuller contact per cycle. And it just, it basically, it equalizes the subglottal and the supraglottal pressure. So the pressure below and above the vocal folds. Um, so yeah, the, it balances out the pressure that's coming up from the air that's going through the vocal folds with back pressure. And so it kind of evens out the, the movement and squares things up. Yep, and more efficiency. Um, but there's a lot of things around mathematical equations and acoustic impedance that I don't understand. <laughs> but I know it works, yeah.